see if you can hear. Like just li- <laughs> like actually just try to listen to like what's going on rather than just blasting it. You know, no. dude. Yeah, I, that's why I don't use AirPods anymore because they're just so deep in there that I was like, this can't be good for my future. Like <laughs> this yeah. is so new. <laughs> think about I how think, new that is. I know. I think the wires are supposed to be better and stuff too because of the fucking whatever EMFs and all that. Yeah. I, yeah. Whenever my daughter has her AirPods in. It's like, dude, I can hear everything you're listening to, but I'm like on the other side of the house. Like, it's probably not good. Hey, okay. Probably wait. not good. It's just like putting your head in like a microwave. <laughs> Guys, yeah. are we going right now? Yeah. All right, Andrew, uh, did, can you please, I don't know if you'll be able to pull this up, but on Huberman's page, he Instagram? has an Instagram. On his Instagram page, he has a video um, where he's talking about, yeah, I think it's his, it's literally, if you go to his feed, and then you go to the, his face is right in the middle. It's like second row down, face in the middle. My mom, when I was a kid, right, she would always scold me and say, Insima, t- yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. but wait, Insima, take your phone out of your pocket. Take it out. Oh, yeah. huh? Do you want to ruin, do you want to have babies? Do you want to have cancer? I was like, mom, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything. It's not a big deal. Play this video. Oh, it's, it's going to do something. Play That's for this video. Sure. Actually, mom fucking this. knew. Oh, she knew. I've heard that carrying your phone in your pocket can reduce your testosterone levels and sperm count. And guess what? That is true. (laughs) The data contained within this meta-analysis and other meta-analyses clearly point out that it can reduce sperm count and maybe testosterone levels significantly, but certainly sperm count and motility significantly. It reduces sperm quality. So should you avoid (laughs) putting your phone in your pocket? Certainly your front pocket, I would suggest yes, right? If you are somebody who is seeking to conceive. Right? I'm not somebody who is going to stop using my smartphone. I don't expect anyone's going to stop using their smartphone. The question is, should you carry it in your front pocket if you're a male? I think to be on the safe side, the answer is probably avoid doing that too much of the time. Ideally, don't do it at all. Then people will say, well, what if I turn off the Wi-Fi or I turn off the cellular access, then is it still a problem? Well, it's a problem due to the heat-related effects And then people say, well, I don't actually feel the heat of the phone. It doesn't get that warm. But the temperature effects of the phone, it turns out, are enough, even under conditions in which people don't report it to be uncomfortably warm, that it can change the temperature milieu of the testicle in ways that can diminish (laughs) sperm quality. How much and how that relates to fertility and healthy pregnancy, not clear. But since we're talking about things to avoid, if your goal is to have a healthy fertilization in pregnancy, well then, by all means, just don't carry it in your front pocket. You might. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's time to get Dr. Batar back on the show again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, right? Yeah, all the 5G and mm-hmm. all that stuff. It is it is interesting. I just think, I think it's good for people to be open-minded that everything that we do, there's a price to pay. Mm. And uh, even with me, I drive a, an electric car, but I'm not naive to the fact that there's a price to pay for that. It seems like it's supposed to be a good thing. It seems like it's supposed to be great for the environment and better, for, but better for what? Better for now, maybe, and maybe not better forever. I don't have know. you heard of like a potential danger of driving electric cars that we have heard about? Well, there's one major danger is that somebody else could potentially take control over it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh. Elon Musk can just decide that he wants everyone to drive off a cliff if mm-hmm. he wanted to. I don't even know if that's true, but... I would imagine, you know, they can program anything into the system or it could potentially be hacked. I don't know, by spies or something. I, I have no idea, but certainly be easier to hack that than it would be uh, someone's old Chevy pickup truck, mm-hmm. right? For yeah. sure, that was a Black Mirror episode. Right. right. Yeah. And uh, But but I do think that a Tesla has a lot of batteries. Mm. Like the entire car is batteries is my understanding. Like the underneath it is lots and lots of batteries. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, wh- what do we do with that waste? How long do those batteries last? From what I've heard, it's not good what we do with that waste. From what I've heard, it's not good what we do with uh, even solar. Like solar lasts X amount of time, and then you get rid of the solar panels, and where do they go? <clears throat> Supposedly they do- dump them off in some village in Africa, and they, they'll, they'll put them in these places where they think that they can get like a resale value for them as if we're like giving somebody technology that they can do something oh. with. But it's that may be the case uh, on the front end, but the back end is they end up with a ton of trash. Yeah. Like I remember when the uh, the Prius, the Toyota Prius got super popular. Um, one, because it was pretty damn ugly, but <laughs> they were saying like, oh, it's good for the environment. And right. somebody broke it down and they were like, okay, like over like a span of, I don't know how many years, a long time, like a Hummer will have a less, a smaller carbon footprint than a mm. 
uh, Prius just because the batteries will just, you can't get rid of them. Like they'll never go away. But like this, um, you know, kind of prehistoric looking thing, you know, will eventually kind of go away or you can recycle it and use it for other things. You can't really use those dead batteries for anything. Right. So I think it's just good to have open mind and stuff like this. And that, uh, that video that Huberman put out, um, do we have like tons and tons of proof, you know, that that's going to make your balls shrink and stuff? I don't know what one person might say. Yeah, there's enough evidence to where I would say there's good proof of that. I would just say, hey, uh, that sounds simple. I can avoid putting my phone in my front pocket. Is there maybe a phone covering or case that I could put my phone in that could potentially block some harmful stuff from it? Because that doesn't sound like that bad of a solution. Mm-hmm. So like what are... I think it's the same thing with fitness and same thing with anything we're doing. It's good to be open-minded. It's also good to be realistic. Like, what can we actually, what changes can I actually make? How can I actually help or contribute in doing this on a daily basis? Or is this some like outlandish thing that I'll never do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But for now, I'm just going to keep using that fanny pack. Yeah. But, but then where's, where do you have your fanny pack? Do you have it across body or right on top of your dick? Well, it has multiple pockets, so it has multiple layers away from my dick rather than mm-hmm. being in my pocket right next okay. to my dick. Remember That's, when you told sense. me to reach into your fanny pack? That was a that was a nasty trick. I, I was like, that was what just is that? Fanny. It was warm. I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Holy yeah. shit, what is that? His man? fanny was warm. Yeah. That makes warm sense. Warm and moist. That Either was- way. I know. I need to keep my hands out of there, I guess. But hey, you know, we managed to change our, I, at least I've changed my mind on that now. And my mom is probably fucking fists up in the air <laughs> because she's told me that since I was mm. like a teenager. Mm-hmm. But there's been a lot of shit, a lot of stuff as far as like this stuff that I think we've changed our mind about. I saw Lane made a video about that recently mm. and I was like, huh, well, we've changed our mind a lot, a lot of shit too. So yeah, we have, uh, what was that? Did you have an opportunity to watch Lane's video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it was pretty good. He changed his mind on, uh, LDL cholesterol, BCAAs. Cause he, I remember I got into BCAAs because I saw Lane Norton talking about them when I was in my early twenties, but now he's like, actually, it's really not that big of a deal. It doesn't mm-hmm. make that much of a difference. Um, 16, eight intermittent fasting. He's changed his mind on mm. as in, in the fact that it doesn't have that big of an effect on gaining muscle. We need to have Eric Serrano on the podcast. I know he's Ooh. doing a little bit of stuff with Merrick health, I believe. Eric mm. Serrano. And Eric uh, is one of the guys that brought fish oil to the market. He brought it to, um, he brought it to Charles Poliquin and Charles Poliquin oh, helped make it famous. He also brought branch chain amino acids. A lot of this stuff just comes from people just kicking up studies and, mm-hmm. and finding information and then trying with athletes and then having, uh, good benefits. And then my understanding is it shifted from BCAAs to essential amino acids. And now people are saying that maybe even those aren't super effective, <laughs> but I want to touch upon this just for a moment, because I think this is, is a value. When you go to try something, it may or may not work great. When you go to try something like, let, let's just take the uh, amino acid example. You might drink a bunch of amino acids during your workout. You might think that they're disgusting or it might hurt your stomach. Um, Maybe you end up on the toilet or something, right? And you just kind of find out like, oh, I did that two or three times, hurt my stomach all, all every time and I can't do it. Somebody else might have some results where they tried it. They don't notice a difference in muscle mass gain or loss. They didn't really notice a difference in their training. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you get somewhere in between, like where I've landed on. I've been messing around with intra-workout carbohydrates and intra-workout formulas for a really, really long time. Branch chain amino acids, essential amino acids. I remember me and John Cena going to Muscle Mag in Venice Beach and buying up tons of uh, bottles of capsules of BCAAs. And then we were trying to figure out how to take the recommended amount because you're supposed to take like 30 or 40 grams of it. God dang. But we couldn't take the amount (laughs) because you'd end up like we would be like training. We're like doing leg presses going Mm -hmm. back and forth and we would burp. And when we would burp, powder powder would come out of our face <laughs> <laughs> like a fucking gust of chalk. You know? <laughs> and John's like, this ain't working. I don't think I'm like, I don't think it's working either. <laughs> I'm like, but I feel good, you know. But anyway, long story short is where I ended up landing on some of this stuff is that <clears throat> having some form of liquid that tastes better than water mm. during a training session mm-hmm. can be effective because it can help you stay hydrated. So when I run, I either have my uh, hydration product in in the water and or I'll have some uh, 
some essential amino acids in there as well. And it's not because I'm like all hyped up on this idea that the uh, fucking amino acids are going to cross the blood brain barrier and make me jacked or whatever the, whatever the science is saying. Um, I've found it to be beneficial just to encourage me to drink water during my training session. And through that process, I noticed that I get a little kickback 20, 30 minutes into the workout. I can work out a little bit harder. I can get in a couple extra reps, a couple extra sets. I don't feel fatigued. And I don't know if it has anything to do with the amino acids. I think it just has to do with staying hydrated. Absolutely. I mean, I, I do a lot of electrolytes. That's the, mm-hmm. that's what I choose to do. Um, but BCAAs, I use them every now and then, but I never really, I, I've always used them very sporadically because right. I never noticed much. Um, but that was one other thing he changed his mind on. And then I think one other thing he said he, uh, changed his mind on was fast cardio. Mm. Um, he used to say it was really beneficial. Now he, he like has cited research and it's not that beneficial in his mind. So Yeah thought that was pretty cool there was one other thing but i forgot what it was what about the power of uh like what about the power of a coach you know your coach says coach says andrew you know i, I want you to do this photo shoot it's gonna be badass mm-hmm. and you're like okay what are the things i need to do and the first thing he rattles off is like you're gonna do fasted cardio it's gonna work amazing and strip body fat off you quick mm-hmm. and you're like all right you know and you go and do it you believe in the coach maybe it's encima that tells you you're like fucking encima is in great shape mm-hmm. i'll try that out you go and try it out, and because you believe in it, maybe it has exponential little bit more of an effect on you than it might on someone who's like, I don't know about the science mm-hmm. on that. You work harder on the cardio because of that. I think that right. coaches hold a lot of power in that sense. And I, you know, one thing is, if you're a coach, I would, I would stray away from like speaking in too harsh absolutes against mm-hmm. like maybe something that the client's thinking, uh, just because like if you're like, oh no, you can't do that, or that's bad for you, or and some th- sometimes certain things might actually be dangerous or stupid, mm-hmm. and I get that. But if your client's interested in I don't know adding some fasting into what they do or adding something into their diet that they didn't have before, um, just maybe try not to speak in too harsh absolutes on like this why this is not this is not going to work for you. This is bad for you. Especially if it's something that's like, there are some people that do it and there are some people that don't kind of, I don't know. Don't, I don't know. You have a lot of influence over somebody when you're a coach. You yeah. Know? Dan, Dan Garner, who's helping me with my marathon prep. Um, <laughs> I had to kind of like flip the script on him a little bit. He, <laughs> he was like, I don't want you running every day. And nah, 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 nah. so I, I called him and we talked about it and I said, I want you just to reframe how you think about running every day. Let's just make it, let's just make it a positive. Like, let's just, let's just say that a new study showed that when you run every day, (laughs) it causes exponential growth that it works out great. And he's like, ah, I didn't really think of it that way. I was like, so I'm not getting rid of, I'm not getting rid of it. Like I'm going to run every day. It's like part of what I'm doing right now. So I was like, just think of it as an advantage. And he was like, Got it. Okay. So he's, he's implementing it. Like he'll give me days where the running is way, way backed off. There might be a day where the the running's crazy and there might be another day where the running's way backed off, but I still get to do what I want to do, which is to run every day. I have a question. Do you think, cause Dan Garter is super intelligent, Yes, he is. Do you, think, do you think anybody else could have said that to him and he would have been like, huh? <laughs> because I'm like, I picture just a, an, a client saying that to him like, Dan, I want you to reframe. <laughs> reframe what you think about running area. He'd probably be like, fuck you. I don't need you as a client. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know though. I could be wrong. You know, I think that uh, he's probably going to, he'd probably in some cases just push back with the information that he currently has. Uh, and if he was... Like, let's say he was uh, working with a fighter and let's say a fighter lost his last fight yeah. and, and the fighter's not in a good spot. You know, he, um, Dan Garner works with uh, Andy Galpin and they have a business together where they help a lot of uh, professionals. And so, you know, if you have things where you're like, hey, you know, you already had an opportunity to try that and it didn't really work great for you. So let's maybe move on. So, yeah, I mean, he might have given uh, more pushback to some other people, but uh, with me, it's really cool because he knows a lot about me. He's been following our podcast for a long time. He's been following a lot of this stuff uh, for a while. And he knows uh, he knows I know quite a bit about training. So we go back and forth on different ideas, whether I'm pushing too hard or pushing too little. or. Um, but the cool thing is that he's open-minded. And so when I make a suggestion to him, um, 
He's like, yeah. He's like, that's not the way I did it. That's not the way I would recommend everyone to do it. But he's like, I don't know. Maybe if, maybe this will work amazing for you. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's, that's really awesome that he's that open-minded about that. Um, and I mean, one thing that you mentioned that he said to you is that he's very surprised at your recovery. Because you, what is today for you as far as running every day? Do you know what today's I, I number think, is? I think I'm getting in like the 160s or so. 160 something days of running. And obviously, you know, some days are harder than others. But he mentioned to you that your recovery is something wild mm-hmm. in terms of like how fast you're being a, and how, how you're handling this mileage too. Yeah. It's like, I, I wonder why that is for you, why you're able to handle so much volume. Well, you, I mean, it has to be part of, partly your recovery, but that is pretty, pretty crazy. Are you speculating <laughs> I'm on performance enhancing drugs? <laughs> hey, I don't know what other stuff you're on other than <laughs> whatever you've mentioned you're on. <laughs> what's going on with the show this show used to be great remember that andrew we're trying to out you yeah <laughs> it can't all be that though like your years of training you've you've done a lot of shit yeah you know? so no it's uh i think in training and in trying to make yourself better you have to be really honest with the stuff that you're doing and you have to learn how to feel stuff and it takes a while to even learn how to feel something properly. So mm. f- for me, there could be, there could be some part of uh, of being a little naive to running since I'm still new to it. Like maybe there's certain things that like I just uh, maybe there's things I'm just kind of accepting to feel a certain way. Like oh, this is going to be kind of difficult. My legs are going to get kind of tired. My calves are going to get pretty pumped. But maybe uh, somebody else that that hasn't had maybe as much training, even though I'm not really trained in running maybe they would stop earlier or maybe they, uh, or maybe they would be afraid to stop. I'm not afraid to stop. Like I, when I was running today, I found that the days that are calmed down are actually harder than the intense days. Um, it would be like, it would be like if I told you to act sad, if I told you to cry, you could cry, but if I told you to be yourself, it would be, it would be more difficult. Right, like if you told me to be myself. Yeah, if I told you, hey, we're gonna do this scene, and you got to be yourself, you'd be like, I don't, I don't even know if we're to mm. fucking start with that. Yeah, actually, that'd be pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like more difficult. <laughs> so I found like the more like hype that you need for something, the easier it is for me, because I feel like I can express that pretty good. Like if I need to run faster, I can put more force in the ground. I can run faster. But if I'm supposed to do something kind of calmly, <laughs> and real chill, and just like, hey, go do you, go run. Whatever speed you end up running at, just stay at that. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so you got to spend a lot of time doing these things. And then you start to learn, okay, when I'm running hard, this is the speed I run at. When I am running at a real moderate pace, this is where I'm going at. And you can learn that through lifting and you can learn that. I just, I think at this point, I know a lot about my body and I know about how much recovery I need I think I have a good idea of uh, how things should work. And the smallest things are like unacceptable to me. Like I had my pinky toe uh, when I did the 20 miles the other day. It was bothering me a lot. I kept looking at it and I'm trying to like, I'm like putting readers on and shit. And I'm like trying to examine it. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I think there's something wrong with my pinky toe. (laughs) She's like, "Uh, it's a little red. I'm like, is there anything else going on? Is there something wrong with the nail or whatever? Or it's like, nah, it's just red. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then something happened to the other pinky toe the mm-hmm. other day. And the same thing. I was just kind of like looking at it and I'm like, did I fuck something up? Because I don't want to be on a run and I don't want something like being in my head. I don't want something uh, that could have been controllable for me. I could have maybe clipped my toenail. I could have maybe took a little fucking file. Uh, I could have uh, put a Band-Aid on it. I could have uh, wore different socks or something. I could have done something ahead of time mm-hmm. uh, to manage that. And same thing with like a calf or something. If I'm running, I'm like, oh, that's there's something in the calf today. Oh, shit. You know, I heard my friend talk about how he hurt his Achilles and he was only a couple weeks out from competition. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, there's not much I can do about it now. It doesn't hurt bad. I'm not going to hurt my, I got to be honest with myself. If I'm going to hurt myself. Then I need to fucking probably stop. Right. But. I feel good. I'm going to be calm and I'm just going to, I'm going to get through this workout, but I'm going to go home and I'm going to check on this fucking thing and see what's going on. I'm going to do myofascial release. I'm going to call up my buddy, Oscar. 
and see if Oscar can help me work on my feet and work on my calves and mm. get all these different things worked out. Let's find the root cause of it. Hey, Pat Roger family, shut your f***ing mouth. No, not, not really, but kind of. You should keep your mouth shut when you're asleep. Now, on the podcast, we've been talking about the importance of nasal breathing for years, and we've been talking about using mouth tape during your sleep for years as it's going to help your sleep quality because you're going to be breathing through your nose. We had James Nestor, author of Why We Sleep. Actually, that was Matthew Walker, but James Nestor, author of Breathe. We had Patch McEwen. Um, we've had so many people talk about the importance of taping your mouth and breathing through your nose when you sleep for your sleep quality, which helps your recovery, which helps every aspect of your health and fitness. So hostage tape. If you want to get some of this to help you sleep better and it also stays on your face, if you're a bearded man, which is one of the big problems with mouth tape, head to hostagetape.com slash power project. And there you can actually get the power project annual deal, which will give you a year supply of hostage tape, 55 cents a day for tape pretty much. And you'll be able to save $150 along with getting two tins, a year supply of tape and a blindfold. That is going to be something that you want to get your hands on. Links in the description, along with the podcast show notes. Shut your f***ing mouth. So in the past, because I think this is something that we've all kind of adjusted the way that we look at it. In the past, and not necessarily chronic pain. So chronic pain being like having back issues for years, me having knee issues for years, right? But pain in and of itself, have you changed the way that you look at the signal of pain when it happens? Like in the past, would you have just, gonna be, would you have just kind of worked through it and been like, mm -hmm. huh? I can deal with this and just squat or still bench or still whatever and be like, ah, let me, let me slap something on this and wait for it to go away. Have you adjusted that? Or what, what do you, what do you think's changed at the way you look at just the signal of pain? I think everything's changed in terms of pain management because I used to just lift really heavy. Like that was the yeah. thing I did in powerlifting, you know, heavy squats, bench, deadlift. Uh, I was just like, yeah, they, they, those exercises, they kind of hurt, you know, there's pain. And anytime I would do a squat for 20 years, it would hurt unless, unless I was completely set up to squat. If I was like hundred percent prepared to squat, it wouldn't hurt. So if I had the right power lifting gear on, if I had the right stance, if I unracked the weight the right way, if I was in the right position, if I took my air in properly, that I could do the lift and I would be like, oh my God, there was no pain on that. But I didn't know how to manage the pain in between. And that's something I really wish I knew how to do because I would go in the gym and I would do these workouts and they would be awesome. I would perform pretty well, mm. but I probably kind of just to be honest, kind of got lucky uh, due to like my weight, due to my strength levels, due to genetics, due to drugs, due to a combination of a bunch of things maybe some proper training, maybe some decent rest protocols. Mm -hmm. um, but also I would throw luck in the mix too, because I'm lucky that I didn't get hurt worse in my powerlifting career. I'm lucky that I didn't end up with some debilitating injury because I didn't know how to manage the pain when I was done with my workouts and when I would go home. And now I feel like I have a recipe to fix myself all the time to the point where right now I'm smashing my feet on this ball um, when I'm at home. I was showing some of the people I had over uh, yesterday for the 49ers game. I was showing some people just all these different things I have at my house mm -hmm. to like, you know, rub on here. Or I'm like, oh, I'll take this uh, Kelly Sturette voodoo floss band and I'll wrap my calf for a little while and I'll move my foot around just while I'm watching TV. And they're like, Andy, does that drive you nuts? She's like, ah. She's like, he just, he's always doing that. So <laughs> she's like, no, it doesn't bother me. But now I know that I have, I have control over this pain. And you mentioned chronic pain. And I think people would be shocked at how much they can do for their own chronic pain. Um, I ran into somebody recently that I, I have a couple people actually recently where I've just did the thing like, Hey, take off your shoes, you know, yes. put, put your foot on this rock or put your foot on this ball. I like, can try, try this. And they're like, Oh, mm -hmm. they're like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. It's a <laughs> fucking devil inside your body. <laughs> but people will find these adhesions all over their body. So how does that register in your brain? Mm. How does that register when you bend over to pick something up? Do you, do you think that when you bend over to pick something up that your body doesn't know that your shin is all fucked up or that your hamstrings all jacked up? I think it does. I think maybe you don't feel it at the moment or maybe you don't get that sensation because they say that when it's a muscle that's jacked up, 
your brain can recognize where it hurts. But when it's your fascia, mm -hmm. your brain's like, something ain't right down there. I don't know where, but something's fucked up. So we're going to move in a different way. And so having Chris Kadowski here, along with a bunch of other people who have ta taught us these things, mm -hmm. this has been revolutionary for my training. And I, it was part of the reason why I talk about it a lot. Being able to manage your own pain is um, probably the most powerful thing that you can do bec because <clears throat> your training is only as good as your recovery. And if you go to train and you overdo something, which is very likely that you're going to push a little bit and you're going to end up with a little something in your leg or your calf or your shin or whatever, you're going to have to figure out a way to be able to manage that. And I didn't know, I, Kelly Strett would talk about mashing and I've been in seminars with him and me and Jesse would do it to each other and we'd kill each other with it. And I understood some of it, but I didn't understand the power of it. And I didn't know that you need a hygiene and a routine with it very, very often. It sucks that you can't just do something once, right? Oh, yeah. Like you just like, you you do it once, you're like, huh, that didn't do much, right? Mm -hmm. And it sucks that you have to continue to do it to really, really get the benefit out of it. You like, can't even find the right spot a lot of times. Right? You have to do, you have to go all over. You know, you have to, you have to find those little spots that are a little bit uncomfortable and lean into those a little bit. I feel like you're about to say something. No, I mean, I'll, to, to me, it reminds me of like when you're trying to chase like a, like a itch on your back and yeah. you, you kind of get it and then it starts moving around. It's like, uh, where is this little fucker? But that's kind of like what it is with these adhesions. And you know, with my back, I've always thought like, Oh, someone needs to like really dig in right where it hurts and like adjust something and then Chris Kadowski comes in he's like oh yeah roll out your uh your your neck and your shoulder just on the left side because that side's a little high and it's kind of pulling a little bit he's like and then uh roll out like the top of your back and then if you want to you can go down to the lower side but focus more on the left side mm -hmm. it's like this is interesting okay I did it for like two months and then I'm like I'm feeling pretty good. And then, you know, as you said, Mark, like the rest of my body, it's like, damn, what else do I need to address? My hips, my freaking quads, like everything is so painful to the touch, you know, now it's a lot better, but it's, you know, it's still there and continuously like smashing all these damn random spots, like daily, my back's been feeling pretty damn good, mm. you know? So it's like, I want it so bad to have the answer just be like, oh, you need to go to the chiropractor and have them pop you this way. Not a full on habit shift. It, exactly. I wanted a, I did want a quick answer, mm -hmm. but I also wanted it to be something that I can just go and like hit a switch, not like a whole like body smashing contouring type thing, you know? Yeah. And you're right, Mark. It's a hygiene thing. It's got to be done daily. You know, it's funny. I find myself like, I love bending to pick things up. <laughs> I really love just like bending and not hip hinging, just bending forcefully with my back and picking things up from the ground. <laughs> nice ass. And yeah, there's nice, say, nice I like it too. back there too. Yeah, but, I don't mind watching. That glute tie-in? <laughs> <laughs> but you no, know, the reason is, is I've found that like now I'm, I'm, I've been starting to reach into ranges that used to be quite uncomfortable, used to be a little bit tight. And I'm just making sure that my body continuously understands that you can pick that up without feeling any type of discomfort. You can bend with your knees without there being any type of discomfort. Mm. Because for years, I had a meniscus surgery and I had Oshkut slaughter on both my knees. So for years, I wasn't running or doing any of that because I kind of felt, oh, I'm just going to have this knee pain. And there are just certain things that I shouldn't do. One of those things being like normal running. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could sprint, but I told myself, okay, running, maybe not your thing because I was avoiding doing things with my knees. But boom, what, does ha what happens when Ben Patrick came, started doing a lot of that stuff. It was difficult initially, and the progression was very, very slow, but over time, by just loading my knees, literally putting pressure into my knees, very uncomfortable initially, but they started to get stronger. Mm. And then now, I'm, I can do a bunch of shit with a deep knee bending and not feel any type of pain or any type of discomfort. But it, it, the, the fact is, to be able to get there, I had to lean into that pain, right? That discomfort and slowly take the time for it to progress. And if I stopped because of how weak it was at the time or how much, how uncomfortable it was at the time, I definitely wouldn't be where I am now with my ability to move. I think people need to be, you know, it's really helpful when you're open-minded. I know we talk about it all the time. So people probably get sick of hearing it. And then there's probably examples of people who are like, well, you guys aren't open-minded with A, B, and C. And mm -hmm. you're probably correct. We're probably not doing a good job of being open-minded across the board. There's plenty of blind spots that I have, I know for sure. Um, but 
in watching Ben Patrick stuff and checking out some of the stuff from functional patterns and in, in learning and knowing Kelly Sturette for so long in talking with Jesse Burdick and JL Holdsworth and Matt winning and talking to all these people, what you'll recognize is these things, they, they keep coming back around. It's a circular thing. I think I've told Andrew this before, because I used to tell everybody in the company, I was like, we're going to meet people and like all kinds of different things are going to happen. But what we're going to notice is, Everything's going to happen in a fucking giant circle. <laughs> We're going to like meet somebody and be like, oh, that guy's dope. He's got good information. And then the guy's going to disappear for a while. No one's going to talk about him for a while. And then he's going to come back around and he'll be popular again. Like it just, <laughs> it's the way, it's just kind of the way that all this stuff works. Kettlebells fall out of favor, then they're in favor. Running falls out of favor, then it's in favor. Lifting falls out of favor. You know, this, the pendulum keeps swinging kind of back and forth and back and forth. And you have to be open-minded to stuff because... What if you could catch something the first time it swings your way rather than like waiting for that motherfucker to come back two, three years later? Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if you could catch it the first time and at least absorb some of it. Then you have a better understanding. You got an idea of like, this could be really helpful. Some of the mobility stuff that I learned from Sturette years ago, it was helpful for me within the given workouts. So I would do some of the band distraction and some of the stuff uh, before workout and then I would get in better position for a squat mm -hmm. but foolishly and I can admit it uh, I discontinued doing that because I started lifting in a different way and I just I didn't need the same range of motion I didn't necessarily for a lot of my lifting a lot of my lifting is in ranges that are pretty safe for me when they're loaded when the things are unloaded, it's normally my own body weight. It's mm -hmm. just something that I've shifted towards and shifted to um, kind of more recently, but it feels good. It kind of seems like it's working. But had I kept some of that stuff in, the band distraction stuff before squats and before some movements, not only would I, the reason why I got rid of it, because I was like, this is kind of only helping me for this workout, which was kind of true because I had to do it every time I went to the gym. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I did it on Monday for squats. And then the next Monday I came in again and didn't need to do it again. So I'd have to do the whole setup all over again every time. But what happens when you squat pain-free and you squat with better efficiency and you squat slightly deeper and you're not mashing and smashing yourself into position just because the weight is carrying you into that position. You're in a stronger, better position. Your body got to that position by itself. How does that register in the body? How does that register in the central nervous system? How does it make the body feel? So these are all things that, you know, now I'm, I was just the other day playing around with some distractions, some hip stuff. And I'm yeah. like, this is just so dumb, you know, learn, learn. <laughs> there are so many different things that we have on our plate and we got a lot of different things going on at once. Um, but if something's going to help, why not fucking keep it in or just keep some dosage of it in there? Mm -hmm. Just some, just maybe a little bit. Dude, you know what's so funny? Uh, I have your the copy of uh, Kelly Sturette's book, Ready to Run, that he gave you. I have it at home because I've been reading it, right? Uh, and that was written in 2014. And I'm going through that book. I'm just like, oh, wow. Feet. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The way you walk. Oh, mashing. All the things <laughs> that we've been talking about that people are like, oh, wow, this is so wild. Rah, rah, rah. Kelly's been talking about probably for, mm -hmm. he had the book in 2014, which means he probably knew about this shit in the mid 2000s, oh, yeah. like in the early 2000s. And just like, Kelly's known. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> Kelly's like, oh, y'all are finally catching up to what I've been well, talking about for he, more than a decade. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what that feels like. <laughs> like, oh, you guys are getting popular talking about stuff I was talking about over I a decade ago. I wrote a book on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how he works with some of the best people in the world. True. You know, I don't want to rattle off names because I don't know what's mm. what he's allowed to talk about, not allowed to talk mm. about, but he literally works with some of the best people and some of the best athletes in the world that are competing right now. And they're competing at a really high level. And a lot of it has to do with his... Um, him sharing this information with them, yeah. him taking a band and saying, Hey, wrap this up really, really tight. And you're like, well, what does that do? Like you just all of a sudden lose a ton of blood flow to the area. You're like, that doesn't seem like it's going to work well. <laughs> yeah. But again, when we had Ben Patrick here, this is how circular everything is. Ben Patrick is the second coming of a Kelly Sturette. That's why we had him on together. Cause I'm like, this guy's on fire the same way that Kelly was on fire. And so much of their concepts, they overlap a lot. They're said differently. There's a lot of different shit going on there. They both have their own concepts. Um, but I was like, man, this is great. The way that they, 
they match up together. So make sure you go back and listen to that podcast because I think it's yeah. incredible to have those two guys on at the same time. But Ben Patrick talking about walking with the sled backwards. Mm -hmm. What is he trying to promote? What is he talking about there? He's talking about a crazy amount of blood flow. He said, I want you to walk so much with the sled that you have a pump to the point where you can barely take another step. You, he mentioned he wanted you to have such a pump that you feel like you can't hurt yourself. And what he meant by that is your, your legs get like numb <laughs> and it feels like you, you wouldn't be able to hurt yourself if you tried because you couldn't produce any force because so much blood flow in those legs. It's the same goddamn thing that happens when you wrap uh, with the voodoo floss. It might not be the same scientifically, but it's very similar in a lot of ways that you're trying to rush a lot of blood to the area. Mm. Let me ask you this. Carbs, right? Now, mm. you've been talking mm -hmm. about carbs for a while. There's a period, you know, you wrote a book called The War on Carbs, right? Now, we've, I think I've, I've also had stage where I've eaten way less carbohydrates or eaten no carbohydrates. Um, but has anything in your mind potentially changed about the use of carbs or eating or anything around carbohydrates? I think a lot of things have changed for me about eating in general. Um, my main shift was to, was just a protein, focusing on eating a lot of protein. And, and I've, I've had that, you know, I've been doing that for a while since I found out about kind of the one gram per pound of body weight type stuff. But in terms of like body weight management and stuff, it was important for me to distance myself from carbohydrates, not because there was anything wrong with carbohydrates. I just had a shitty interpretation of carbohydrates. <laughs> My <laughs> my version of carbohydrates, mm. and even now when I say carbs, I'm thinking pizza, donuts. ice cream, donuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of all that stuff. And Lane Norton um, pointed this out, and he said there's more fat calories in the stuff that you're thinking about than there are <laughs> carbohydrate calories. Ooh. And I was like, oh, yeah, really mm. good point. Because it might, like a donut, I don't know, I'm going to make it up and say donut has 10 grams of fat or something. <laughs> 15 That's a healthy ass donut <laughs> well, yeah like, well, donuts are healthy if we think of like a crispy cream glazed mm. donut let's look it up yeah let's okay. look look up crispy cream glaze i bet you that there's maybe 30 grams of fat. Oh, that's there. awesome. I would feel as if there's 30 grams of fat, but I could be totally off. Might be more. Are you still on that sausage McMuffin diet? Dude, you know what's the problem? Okay, so I decided last night, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go on too long about this, but I decided to get get a bottle of Simply Lemonade. <laughs> but I only got one. You're back only, on the juice? No, just one, just one <laughs> bottle. On just juice. one bottle. So like Sam, like when, when it came through DoorDash, because yeah, we DoorDash suspect. groceries, Sam saw and she's like, and Seema, not again. <laughs> she's like, you can't do this to yourself again. I'm like, Sam, it's just one bottle of juice. Come on now. And it's one of the big like 52 ounce ones, but I'm done. Yeah, the first one that comes up is a little suspect in my opinion. It says 15 grams of fat and 31 grams of uh, carbs. Yeah. Maybe, okay. Yeah, so okay. that's, that's a, but anyway, the, the calories for fat are, it's 15 times nine, so there would be mm -hmm. more fat calories in there, pr proving, proving the point. Yes. I could make this fit in my macros. So uh, for me, I, I actually wasn't a person that thought that I couldn't eat carbs. I, mm -hmm. wasn't, I wasn't in that category. I wasn't like, I got bad genetics. I don't handle carbs very well. I, was, I never <laughs> thought that. Um, I, I just thought that, um, I thought that I needed to get myself to a certain like body fat percentage level, I guess, to be able to have more wiggle room with carbohydrates, which I still kind of think is true. I don't necessarily just, I don't disagree with that. But, I get what you're saying. But at this point, I mean, my body fat levels are great. So I don't need, I don't have a worry with, uh, with even just carbohydrates. But anyway, my whole, my whole thing is uh, nowadays is to just fuel myself so that the workouts feel really good. I want good performance with my workouts. If I don't feel like working out on a particular day, I don't look at that necessarily as a motivation problem. My question is, did you eat enough yesterday? What was yesterday's workout like? Um, if you don't feel like lifting, like how much running have you been doing in the last four or five days? Okay. Well, you ran fucking 20 miles the other day. Maybe that's why I don't feel like lifting. Um, what's the fuel like? What's the sleep like? So that's where I usually look and that's where I'll say, okay, let me, let me up the carbohydrates uh, a bit. But nowadays I eat a lot of fruit. Um, I eat rice, I eat potatoes. Um, I'll eat dark chocolate. I'll have nuts here and there. <laughs> But I still, I, for me, I still need to like pay attention to the types of foods that I eat because the food, the food choices 
still can lead me down to a path of me overeating. And at this point, it's not necessarily about body composition, but it's about my own body weight. Mm. Like for April, I would like to weigh probably between 210, 215 for the race. Whoa. And right now I'm around 225 most mornings. So I still have, we'll see, we'll see where I end up. Um, 215 would be between 215 and 220 would even be fine. Uh, Cause I don't need to lose like a ton of weight anytime rapidly, but just the, my, the sheer body weight that you're lugging around during yeah. these uh, runs <laughs> uh, can be, uh, can be impactful. So that's what I'm kind of looking to do, but yeah, I have changed the way that I think about food in general. Again, I've said this many times on the show, but I think this is really useful for people. Mm-hmm. Look at carbohydrates and fats as energy sources for the body and look at protein as a building block of the body. I would go as far as to say that protein is free, fiber is free, fruit is free, vegetables are free. What I mean by free, eat as much of them as you fucking want. Like eat a fucking crazy amount of those things. Uh, if you're new to dieting and you've never tried it before, don't even bother to really mess around with fasting. Just eat a ton of what I just said Yeah. for maybe a week or two, like be a little patient with it. Over time, you're going to probably find yourself uh, eating less and uh, starting to lose some weight. Dude, what was your body? Like, how much did you weigh during your bodybuilding show? Because you were like 220, right? On stage. Mm-hmm. But you're, obviously, your body composition was different. You might yeah. have been holding a bit more muscle. But you were 220 on stage, right? I think uh, the day of the show, because of like the carb up and everything, I think I was like 230. So you might be, well, you said 215 to 220, but you might be down to like 210. For yeah. the Boston Marathon, yeah. that's that's yeah. wild. That is wild. Uh, I don't if, think I've ever had this uh, low of actual body fat on my body before. Oh, just holding and chilling, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, again, during the bodybuilding show, my body fat percentage may have been better because I may have had a little bit more muscle. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I've ever had this low. Because I can kind of, t- because like, because I was so big before, um. I have a little bit of loose skin in certain spots, um, and I never really saw that before. I think, again, the bodybuilding show, I think I held on to enough muscle to where that was a little less noticeable. Not that it's noticeable or bugs me at all. It's just something I observed. Um, But I think I have less body fat on me now than I ever have before. That's sick. Yeah, when it comes to carbohydrates, like there was a point when I was younger and I was like tracking macros to be able Mm -hmm. to grow. I'd be eating 300, 400 some days, like I think at max, maybe 450 grams of carbs a day. And my fats would be mm-hmm. around 50 or 60. But I was eating a lot of carbs because one of my things was I thought like you needed to do that to gain muscle. I haven't thought that in a while. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. But one thing that I've done more now is that sometimes people ask, oh, how much do you eat each day? Or what are your calories each day? I don't have a calorie amount each day. The main thing that I'm super rigid on is making sure I get in enough protein. But as far as energy calories, right? Carbs and fats, I eat how much I feel like I need to eat on any Mm -hmm. specific day to be able to perform the next day. So like certain days, I'm feeling a little bit more tired. I will eat a lot. It could be like 3,000, 4,000 calories, right? It could be, it could be around that amount. But the next day, if I don't feel the need to eat a lot of food, I might eat like I eat 1800 calories or something the mm-hmm. next day because I, it, it's, it, it ranges from the day to day. So my food is not extremely consistent each day, but my performance is consistent because I know like I can feel how much I need to eat now. And I know it sounds so fucking vague, but I think one of the ways I got there has been just eating to perform for years. So now I kind of know, okay, this is how much I need to eat, or this is what I should eat today. And then I don't eat necessarily now to feel extremely full. I eat until I'm good, like I'm satiated, and then I'm done. And what that's done for me is for the past few years, my body weight has been pretty much every single morning. I've been 250 for upwards of three or four or five years now. Like Mm. I can't remember the last time I touched 260 or I was low as in the low 240s. It's just been the same weight, but body composition has continually gotten a bit better. Mm. So That's, I guess, a mindset shift that I've had as far as food. It doesn't need to be the same thing every day. You just need to eat what you need to eat so that you can perform well. And if your performance is dipping, maybe you might need to eat a little bit more. Or maybe you need to hydrate better. There's tons Mm -hmm. of things. But when it comes to food, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, I think when you have uh, the 
when you have performance as your main marker, it's really nice because it, a lot of other things will fall in place. Mm -hmm. If your training feels good, if you're somebody that wants to like bodybuild and you're trying to get pumps during a workout, it you know, it's a, that's a good marker. Like, are you getting good pumps? Are you able to handle some weight? I do recommend that people go all in on some of these things. Like, like go, go all, go all in, like go all in, like fucking take a journal, write down your reps and sets, like get nerdy with it. Get, you know, uh, fucking spreadsheet, like whatever, however nerdy that you can handle. Yeah. Because I think it's good to have the information. I'm not a huge fan of counting calories, but what are you going to do when you're, when you're someone like Kenny, Kenny Williams, right? Kenny Williams, yeah. When you're someone like Kenny Williams, who's a young guy who's hungry that wants, he's literally hungry, <laughs> who's a young guy who's hungry, who who wants to kick ass in bodybuilding. It's like, well, fucking man, maybe you should track your shit. Yeah, maybe you it. should pay attention to exactly what you're eating. Maybe you should do what Kenny's doing, where you get a coach and you have somebody that's looking over it and they give you your macros. And you, I think it's a really wise decision to go all in and to look at it because then you're able to learn. And then he, Kenny for the rest of his life can kind of, he can go back and forth. You and I have had coaches. We've had people that have helped us. We've had mentors mm -hmm. and it's really, really valuable just to, to learn these things. Otherwise you're kind of just, you're, you're guessing a lot. And Seema, these days though, how much fat do you think you're getting in? Cause you said you were eating about what, 50 grams when you were eating. When I was having all Yeah. Those lots carbs, of carbs yeah. these days. What's, where do you think it's at? Uh, minimum 80. Okay. Minimum. So still 80. not very high though. Uh, well, 80 for a lot of people is like, a, I'm having minimum 80. So that means some days it could be 100 okay. and something. But like, I'm never going to, 80 is not a low amount of fat for even a guy my size. It's it's not. So, yeah. Really? I, I would, exp I, I don't know, I was like expecting like 100 grams. 100 grams of fat, 900 calories, some days. That's why I said minimum yeah. 80. Because okay. some days it's probably going to be more than that, but it never goes lower than that. You probably don't really eat stuff that has like a lot of fat in it, right? Like I, I guess occasionally you might have some I'll kind use of, butter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. I'll use butter. Um, I yeah, Butter, eggs. Eggs. But like eyes. I always eat ribeyes. Like whenever we get Piedmontese mm -hmm. stuff, I always choose the fattier cuts of meat because mm -hmm. like I like fat in my meat. I don't usually, right. like, I'll have some of the leaner stuff sometimes, but I'll always get higher fat. I use quite a bit of butter. When I eat chicken, when I choose to eat chicken, it's always fucking wings um, or thighs, but it's usually wings and I mm -hmm. don't get rid of skin at all. Um, all of the, yeah, I buy a lot of, like, for example, there's this meat called oxtail. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I use that in good. soup, but like, yeah, it also has like this fucking, like inside of the meat is fat, but on the outer edge, it's like this chunky fat. I'll mm -hmm. eat that too. Like I make sure that I keep fat in my diet. Right. Um, it never that that's something that I'll never go low on again. You uh, <laughs> you never probably again. it would probably be like extremely rare for you to have like less than like a pound of meat in a day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I heard Alex Hermosi gave a really awesome and interesting tip uh, to where he just said like if you weigh a hundred pounds, ha have a uh, if you weigh a hundred pounds, have one pound of, <clears throat> one pound of protein every day. If you mm. weigh one fifty, have one point five. If you weigh two hundred have two pounds and it actually the math works out pretty good mm. so that's a decent thing to kind of reference and then also you know you got other forms of protein in there too you might have eggs mm. and you might have protein shakes and stuff so you can mm. you can reduce a little bit from there um but i think again like just when you start to write this stuff down you start to track your reps and your sets you start to track everything that you're doing you get to kind of see like how much fuel do you really need like do you <laughs> You know, how, how many fat calories do you really need? How many carbohydrates do you really need? Uh, it's not always a great idea to look up ancestral stuff because we just live in a, such a different time. You can DoorDash stuff and you can get stuff really easy. And it's, it's, a, it's awesome. It's amazing to be able to, to do that. Um, but there used to be a cost to getting food. It used to cost you calories to go get something, to go get food. So, you know, how many carbohydrates do you need in a given day? Well, I guess it would depend on what you're doing. Trying to run a marathon, maybe you need like a decent amount. Trying to be a pro bodybuilder or just trying to be a bodybuilder and get big, um, maybe it'd be a good idea to fill out that pr fill out that protein pretty damn high. Um, eat maybe like double your body weight and carbohydrates, right? Somewhere in that category. But if you're your average person and you're getting some exercise in here and there, you can afford to do maybe an hour a day. 100 to 200 grams of carbs should have you covered, I yeah. think. 
100 to 200 grams of carbs, you should be pretty covered. Um, the, the liver stores some carbohydrates, the bloodstream stores some carbohydrates, but it's not, it's not tremendous amounts, but it's plenty for you to have stored. You're not going to all of a sudden just have this crazy dip in energy because your carbohydrates are modest, mm. you know? Also, uh, I'm just going to reiterate this, and this is kind of an aside, but make sure you get fucking electrolytes in every mm. single day. Hydration is something... It's not like I'm ch I've changed my mind on it or it's not like we've changed our mind on it, but I am so consistent mm -hmm. with hydration just because of the sheer, I mean, you were talking about, we were talking about this recently, <laughs> the sheer amount of sweat we sweat with the things oh, yeah. we do. Like after mm -hmm. jujitsu, Mikey's disgusting. Like I know, <laughs> I know I've lost a ton of weight, right? And after your runs, mm -hmm. you've mentioned like, you, well, you lost how many pounds on one of your runs? Like 11 pounds. Right? Like, if And that's a controllable thing, right? So I was like, I'm not going to allow that to happen again. So I think... When I ran 20 miles the other day, I lost like three pounds. I'm like, that's Damn. acceptable. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But yeah. 11 pounds, that's fucking ridiculous. That was with drinking a lot of water even. Mm -hmm. I still lost 11 pounds. I down a good amount of water with electrolytes every single morning. I don't I don't miss that because like I if whether I'm going to go take a run or I think I just read it in, in Kelly's book, like you want to make sure that your tissues are hydrated, right? But if you just like, if you drink a little bit of water and then you warm yourself up and you go do something and you're not hydrated well, mm -hmm. you're looking for a harder time than you need to have. You get hurt. You can easily get yeah, hurt. I've never sweat this much before. Like my gi and my gi pants, they're both just soaked. I'm like, how the fuck? Like, I'm not even like, it's, yeah. you're not paying attention, but um, yeah, like when I come here and I'm not hydrated, my lips get all dry. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> like I'm hurting. It's uh -huh. like I already down some water and I need to go get some more because that's been crucial. Because mm -hmm. the days where I'm not hydrated, I can tell. Like yeah. the performance is just not there. Mm -hmm. It sucks. This yeah. has been kind of a longer thing for me, but something I've changed my perspective on a lot is uh, just being more open to, I guess, just different people doing different shit. You know, I always kind of like... <laughs> whatever I do, I'm a huge fan of. And then when someone else wasn't doing something the same thing or the same way or living their life a similar way. Why aren't you benching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that kind of shit, you know? Or um, even some, something like uh, Kratom or marijuana or alcohol or any of these things. Like, I just, you know, you try to learn to just let people enjoy what they want to enjoy and uh, be open-minded to the fact that maybe some of these things could be not such a bad idea for you. Maybe it could help you loosen up. Maybe it could help you come to a realization. Mushrooms and things like that. I know, I know it's a touchy subject and uh, there's, there's reason. These are really powerful. These are powerful, powerful things. So you want to be cautious with these things, but I mean, what if, just what if some of these ideas or what if some of these concepts or even a drug or a mushroom or something like that, what if it changes your life forever? You know, what if it's something that, uh, gets you uh, to open your mind towards something that you maybe previously were closed minded to. Yeah. I, you know, one thing that I see a lot is like when some people see new things and even when I used to see new things when I was younger, I'd be like, what's this new fad? Like this thing's going to mm -hmm. die out soon. Right. Whereas now there's so fucking hell the, the ropes that David Weck introduced mm -hmm. us to. Right. When I was younger, I'd probably look at those and be like, what kind of stupid looking fad is this? Yeah, why are we See, training arms? Looking at, <laughs> right? yeah. like, looking at somebody fucking putting ropes over their body and going like that. I'd be like, you're, there's a word I would have used a while back years ago that I'm just not going <laughs> to use. But I'd just be like, what the fuck? But, but now nah, I won't use that word because it's not okay to use. It's not a good word. But also um, at the same time after doing some of that stuff i can see wow this is really beneficial for the way your body moves for getting some spinal movement in it makes a lot of sense so generally just being open minded to that type of stuff and one thing that i you know i love lifting and bodybuilding is what got me into the gym um but one thing i think is that you can definitely overdo isolation work mm. you know like, like the whole goal of bodybuilding is to build specific, like build muscles so that you have first off big muscles but you also have an, an aesthetic frame and a lot of stuff a lot of isolation work is used to do that but what tends to happen when you overdo like bicep curls and tricep pushdowns and all these different movements is you can lose the ability for your body to know how to like work together on things which is why like I think isolation work is good. I'm never going to stop bicep curling and doing other movements. But in the back of my mind, I'm trying to also figure out how can I incorporate, how can I make sure that I keep 
movement, right? Overall body movement, a part of what I do so that that ability isn't lost. Luckily, I do have jujitsu, which is something that has your whole body work together. But I also figure out ways to, you know, get as long of a range and get as much of my body potentially working towards that movement to help me just keep that integrity. Because when you look at high level bodybuilders move, they might be flexible, but then when you see them walk or you even see them Mm. try to run, they look like little mini robots. Mm -hmm. And long-term, you don't want to move that way. So uh, that's one thing I've kind of adjusted or changed my mind on. Like, I think bodybuilding's cool, but how can you make sure to, and and bodybuilding is good for everybody. It's almost good for every sport. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But how can you make sure that you keep the integrity of the way your body moves top of mind as your triceps are getting bigger, right? And you can mix it too, right? You can do like walking lunges and you could do box jumps and you can have that mixed in with drop sets of leg press and things like that, right? Absolutely. You, you, you can do all of that. And you can also make sure that like, you know, if you're doing something like, I mean, we were doing this today, but I was doing some squats, And there's a benefit in spinal compression. A lot of people have talked about how that's beneficial in terms of bone density over time. And, but one of the things that happens when you're squatting is that your spine, as it should be during your squat, your spine is stiff. And when you get out of underneath the barbell, your spine feels stiff. So, it, while barbell squatting, I was going and I was doing a cable, uh, like a cable Jefferson curl to help decompress because I'm going from compression that I can go to decompression. And you just try to figure that with other movements you're doing. Like mm. instead of doing a, a, like a bicep curl with a really short range, how can you increase that range of that bicep curl? Because now when I do bicep curls, I don't only feel it in my bicep, but when I'm doing, when I'm sitting, I'm doing incline bicep curls and my arms out here, I feel a deep stretch throughout this whole line. Right. And that's what I kind of want to feel. My bicep's still working, but everything else is, mm. it, it, it's not taking away from my ability to move. So that's something I think is kind of adjusted in the way I look at the way I lift and the way I bodybuild, because I'm never going to stop bodybuilding. Power Project family, your normal shoes are making you weak. This is why I partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes, because they have a wide toe box, they're flat, and they're flexible. So with every single step you're taking, if you're taking a 10-minute walk outside, or when you're working out in the gym, your feet are able to do what they're supposed to do in this shoe. They have tons of options for hiking, running, training in the gym, chilling and relaxing, casual shoes for if you're out on a date. You need to check them out. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. And you guys will receive 15% off your order automatically. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, I think getting in just a variation of movements, um, thinking about thinking about the movements and thinking about like uh, – how they can keep you mobile and what are you doing the movements for? You know, I think that's kind of like put that first and foremost, you know, are you, are you doing an exercise uh, because you're trying to have like a bigger chest? Well, maybe there's, maybe there's a couple different ways you can go about doing it that you're not currently thinking of right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Could you, you know, get your legs to be bigger, but also while you're getting your legs to be bigger, Can you keep your range of motion? Can you keep your mobility? Can you increase your bench press but keep your shoulders mobile? Would there be a way for you to uh, maybe finish some workouts with some dips where you get good ranges of motion or something? You know, just being really thoughtful, just trying to think about what is this exercise for? What is it doing? How do you want to perform the exercise? Something like a squat. Like if you're trying to squat and you're trying to get you, like the main mission of the squat is I want to have a beautiful looking squat. I want to do full range of motion squats and I want it to be something that's shared on squat university. I want to do these awesome full range of motion squats. Well, you probably don't need a lot of weight to do that. And, and you might not even need a barbell on your back. Maybe you just start with like a goblet squat mm. to get you there first. Maybe you need, maybe you need a slant board and a kettlebell to do a goblet squat off of the slant board because that's going to get you nice and low. That's going to get your hamstrings resting on your calves. You just have to kind of give some thought to like, what am I doing this for? Uh, Am I just trying to make an Instagram post of me doing the same old thing again? Like a 405 squat? Is that really a 405 box squat? Is that really something that if you really want to do it and you really like it, then that's fine. Then do it. But if it's, it's to have like some sort of desired result 
um, and to have you head in a particular direction, just I, I think it's important that you review. Do you have two or three reasons behind it that you think are actually going to progress you in that direction? Because if you don't have two or three good reasons behind it uh, that are going to progress you in that direction, then it's probably not going to help. Mm. So, so I I see people do a lot of movements in the gym or they talk about a lot of things. And I'm like, well, somebody might say that they have um, just limited range of motion is always the thing that comes to mind. They have a limited range of motion with something. And then my follow-up is usually like, what are you doing for that? Mm -hmm. And then they're usually not doing much for it. Um, they might say, oh, well, I do some stiff leg deadlifts here and there. Uh, well, doing stiff leg deadlifts here and there, obviously it's not really working because you just mentioned how you have this. Do you want to improve that or not? If you do want to improve it, then let's look at a bunch of things that we can. You might have to be open-minded towards some things that you haven't tried before. You might have to look at Ben Patrick stuff. You might have to look at functional patterns. You may have to do myofascial release. There might be a bunch of things that you might need to do that maybe you don't actually really want to do, but they're going to get you towards that goal. Mm. I just feel like people don't, uh, obviously people don't have patience, myself included, but it just seems like with some of that stuff, like let's say somebody's chasing a, a uh, let's say a 500 pound squat, like that's a huge PR for them. Mm. They're at four and change, but they can't get, they're, they're very close, right? I mean, we'll just, whatever number you can think of in your head that they're very close. Mm -hmm. And then Mark is telling them, like, well, let's step off the gas a little bit and go around this way instead of banging your head against this brick wall over here. Try going around the other way. It's very hard to let go because mm -hmm. they are very close. Um, so in your opinion, I mean, like, how long would it take for somebody to kind of like, like for yourself, like when you went from nine something to over a thousand like what was that like time period where you had to start listening to kelly and some of the things that he had been recommending man everyone's going to be so different on this yeah um you know i just i talked with mark sisson today and he was talking about some marathon running and he said i don't advise for people he's run a ton of marathons he's very proficient high level uh, triathlete for many many years mark is like 68 years old and shredded looks amazing mm -hmm. um and he said you know look i don't advise that people run marathons but if you're going to run marathons i'm going to allow you to run one marathon get a time see what that looks like and then your next marathon you need to get under three hours if you don't get under three hours stop doing it because you're not a runner find something else to do <laughs> <laughs> now that's very harsh you know um but it does give you the concept of like, if you like doing something, that's different than if you want to be really good at something. Mm -hmm. You want to kick ass and be competitive at something, it's kind of a different thing. And so for me with powerlifting, uh, that was what I was good at. And so the moment I squatted 905, what was on the radar right away was 1,000 pounds. Like, you know, I squatted 859 in a meet, and I remember thinking like, oh, wow, like... The, thousand pounds is a lot closer than I think 140 pounds, like a, you know, 135 pounds, 140 pounds on a bar mm -hmm. is just one plate on the bar. Everyone does that. You know, you get fired up to do that one plate when you're a kid, <laughs> when you start lifting. Right. And that's, uh, that's something that you get kind of excited about. So I was pumped. I was like, wow, I'm literally like just that far away from a thousand pounds. So it didn't take long. And when I met Kelly and Kelly started talking about some of the ideas that I kind of had in my head, but he worded it better to me. Um, and he encouraged it more. So like some of these ideas I had of like keeping my feet straight when I squatted, um, I would actually keep my feet really straight when I squatted in training. And then when I went to the meet, I'd point them out just a little bit, just to give me a little freedom in the hips. Um, but when Kelly came around and we talked about like trying to screw your feet into the ground and really get this like pressure and trying to like spread the toes and mm -hmm. kind of cl like claw at the ground with your toes and all this stuff. Um, I just went all in on that stuff and really worked on it and did a lot of his mobility stuff with the hip to try to get the hip to open up so that the knees could track outward to uh, where my ankles were. Kind of get like getting somebody in my guard or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to shove those knees way out, shove those knees way, way out. And I got better at that, more proficient at that and stronger at that. And as I got better at that, I could sit into the pocket of a squat a lot easier. And the proficiency just got better and better. So 
I squatted, I think nine, like not like nine fifty or something like that, maybe in the gym or maybe in a meet. I don't remember. Um, and it was like maybe six months later, I squatted a thousand pounds. It didn't take long. And then when I, I went right, right from that thousand to a thousand forty one and then right to a thousand eighty. It all happened in a really short time span because I was proficient at what I was doing. But then I met somebody that knew a lot about mm. mechanics of the body. And I remember too, like being really cautious with Kelly, like kind of like not listening to him all the way. I would like kind of listen to him at afar. And then when I met him in person and we started talking more, I was like, oh, I think I can trust this guy. Like he knows what he's talking about. And then he said something that opened my ears. And this is a really valuable thing for people. If you want people to listen to your message, if you want people to try what you're talking about, you're going to have to say stuff that's really convincing for them to actually buy into what you're doing. If you don't care and you just are trying to share information and you don't give a fuck if anybody tries it, that's different, I guess. But I think most of us, we would love it if somebody tried to exercise that we're, you know, uh, proposing to somebody or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, Kelly said, I don't know anything about powerlifting, but I know a lot about human movement. And I was like, boom, done. I'm in. Like, he didn't have to say that. Like, that does, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know anything about powerlifting. It doesn't mean that he knows, doesn't know anything about strength, but it empowered me because he's like, I don't know your sport, dude, but I know a lot about how people are supposed to move. And I was like, now he's got my attention because he respects what I'm doing. I got respect for what he's doing. I'm just going to fucking go all in on what he said. Yep. <laughs> Kelly's known forever. He's got it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty funny. Cool. But, you know, I had to be open-minded to that. Why would I just listen to, why would I just listen to some crazy doctor who started a mobility wad, <laughs> a mobility wad, uh, you know, video stuff on the internet where he's like teaching flight attendants and stuff on planes, how to like uh, do a couch stretch so their hips don't get tight so their back doesn't hurt. <laughs> You know, you're, you're going to, you're not, you don't know where you're going to find this information from. Uh, what about this stuff? Hostage tape. This is dumb, right? Like <laughs> tape your mouth shut to go to sleep. Okay, Remember when we soft. first heard about it? Right. It we were like, so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Ron was telling us about taping his mouth. You guys don't know about tape. And we're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to sleep without this anymore. Like I was running low at my house and I'm like, oh my God, I think I have one. Like I'm feverishly looking in my drawer and stuff. And I'm like, I think I got one more left. <laughs> but it makes a big difference. These things that, uh, I don't know, maybe we otherwise didn't think about as much or didn't believe in as much. They've made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing for sure recently, and this came from Encima and a couple other guests that talked about breathing, but like the bracing for everything, for literally everything. Um, reading Stuart McGill's book, uh, Back Mechanic, about like when I do go to pick something up, basically act like I'm going to go do a, you know, squat PR and and get real tight and go for it and be like, oh, that hurt my back, but I'm okay because I'm, I'm not like debilitated now because I got through it. And then in SEMA one day was like, what happens if you just like bend down and, you know, touch your shoes or whatever and be like, oh, I just do it. I was like, but it's funny because if I went to go pick up something off this chair, I'd have to brace and it'd be painful. So kind of letting go of that and going more with the flow of things yeah. is something that I've changed recently. And it's been huge. Like from, I mean, I'm trying to do it in jujitsu and that's, I think part, part of why I like my ribs were so jacked up because I'm bracing and I'm, I got internal pressure and then the pressure of someone smashing me and it's just like, you know, it popped something, you know, so it was a little bit too much. So now trying to get in rolling with the flow literally is something that I have been trying to mm. get used to lately. That's such an interesting concept, dude. I know. Because, like, when you think of a deadlift or a squat or any of these movements, you generally, you know, you create that intra-abdominal pressure, you brace, and then you handle the load, especially as it gets heavier. But when you think of something like jujitsu, you're not supposed to be bracing whenever you do multiple movements. Like, there's a level of stability your body will have, but you don't need to keep your core super tight because mm -hmm. you can't keep your core tight if you want to move around and move well, right? So when it comes to picking up something off the ground or doing these things, you don't want to have to feel like I have to brace before I do it because that's long term. That's not, that doesn't mm -hmm. seem like an ideal way to move. Yeah, or I'd always be looking for a counter to, to brace my hand on to 
kind of cheat my way through it mm -hmm. and it just uh, just it wasn't working yeah. it's working better now yeah it's nice not to have to think and that's probably where you should be with uh tasks that you're just doing throughout the day you probably mm. shouldn't have to think about them too much but something i did find to be helpful for me uh was to think about opposite sides of the body or just try to think about things differently so i've talked before about like you know raising your right your right arm up as high as you can you know, you could put your right arm up high and you can try to push your, you know, shove your shoulder like towards your ear and stuff like that. And it's like, how do you get that to be higher? Well, you get it to be a lot higher by dropping your left shoulder a lot. You mm -hmm. drop your left shoulder a lot, bring your left shoulder down as much as you can, maybe even bend your left leg. Right leg is straight. And now that mm -hmm. now your uh, middle finger of your right hand couldn't be any further away from like your toes as you do that. Right. Like mm -hmm. it stretches it stretches higher. And in terms of like bending down to pick something up, if you use the front lines of your body, which I think people are always thinking about the back lines of their body. But if you use the front lines of your body and you flex your stomach downward, like you're doing a, um, uh, like a, uh, like a cable crunch, like a cable, like a cable crunch type maneuver. Um, you'll find that picking stuff up will become a lot easier. You can try it right now if you want. Let's fucking stand up for yeah. a second and yeah, just yeah. flex your stomach and your quads, flex your quads and your hip flexors as if you're, feet are like in sand and just pull yourself right down to the ground. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. And try, try to go down further. Like go to like, can... just touch your toes. Just like pull yourself down. Like kind of not fast, but kind of quick. Yep. Yeah. There you go. That's why That's weird. It just, <laughs> it just shifts cool. the focus, you know, like, I don't know how great, I don't know how great it works uh -huh. necessarily, but it just shifts the focus. Like it's dumb. Well, that's <laughs> a, a AMRAP mentality or boy, uh -huh. Jason Kalipa. Um, holy fuck. My, my foot is killing me during this run. And he's like, let me focus in on my breathing. <laughs> you know, how, how is breathing like this? <laughs> like when you're, when your fucking foot hurts, how is that helpful? It's probably making things worse. So, you know, trying to concentrate on something slightly different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I know you didn't change your mind in SEMA with like jujitsu, but like, how did you look at combat sports or martial arts before you started? Mm. Uh, you know, I didn't pay as much of attention as most people did. I watched a little bit of UFC here and there, mm -hmm. but it's not like I was like some fucking, I knew what the fuck they were doing when they were fighting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I, I bring that up because for me personally, I didn't think I'd ever really be able to do jujitsu. Like whether it be physically, I wasn't able to, but I also didn't know if I'd be comfortable, like I had mentioned, like with another dude just sweating on top of me. Mm -hmm. And now I have some like really close friends that do jujitsu and it's like I... It's kind of consumed me you know it's like taking over everything and i had no idea that it would impact me the way it did i thought like maybe it might be kind of like a crossfit thing where it's like i have my like group of guys that i go train with and then that's it but like no now i'm like it's literally my whole life has gone like straight down that path and like i said before like i didn't i would have never assumed or guessed that it would have been anything like that there we go yeah it's been great yeah, that's why people get addicted to it, man. I, it, yeah, I can see. It's fucking awesome. We mentioned some running earlier, and I would just say, like, just flat out that I just didn't know anything about running. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know if I was wrong about writing, running because I just didn't, I had never thought of it. Mm -hmm. I was too fat. <laughs> 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 never thought of it as, like, really, like, an option. But I, I do, I guess my beliefs right now would be that I think – the more things that you have options to do, probably the better. So if you have just a little bit of proficiency with swimming, I think that's a great thing to be able to do. If you've got a little bit of proficiency with being able to do a rope climb, I think that's a great thing to do. A little bit of proficiency with running, that's awesome. Um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to be good at like a lot of different things. But um, if you are good at like a rope climb and you're good at like a squat, I mean, you you probably have really high uh, strength to weight ratio. Your your grip has got to be strong. Your hands got to be strong. It's like that's not an easy thing. That's not a, that's not an easy thing to like figure out. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're they they kind of oppose each other in a way. But I think on a, on a more simplistic uh, note, being able to like just use the assault bike here and there at the gym, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of a workout, or that is your workout for the day. Uh, if you're someone that really likes weights and you're someone that really likes likes to power lift, what's wrong with just saying, you know what? I don't know much about this like endurance stuff, but I'm just going to give the uh, assault bike 
hell for three minutes. Going to try to stay on there and, and produce a decent amount of force for three minutes straight. You find yourself in a whole lot of trouble after 30 seconds. And you'd be like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. That takes a level of resolve. That takes a level of commitment. Um, you're going to find that when you're able to do those workouts with more proficiency, that your other workouts will improve. Your rest between sets will be easier for you to recover from one set to the next. It will also be easier for you to recover from one rep to the next. And it'll also be easier for you to recover from one workout to the next. So trying to build these skill sets, I think, is tremendously valuable. And I've been talking a lot about how having skill sets can really help you to uh, develop some immunity to stress in your life. The more skill sets that you have, let's say you have a really good skill set with reading. Well, maybe your go-to uh, for problems that come into your life is just to go read a book on a particular subject. You're having a problem with your marriage and you're like, oh, I'm going to go read a book about it. And you can read really fucking fast because you learned from Tim Ferriss because mm -hmm. you've been in a growth, space, growth uh, mindset for a long time. That would be a great skill set to have. But without these skill sets, you don't get the ability to defend yourself against a lot of life stresses. They just take you down and beat the shit out of you. Mm -hmm. Want to take us on out of here, Andrew? Sure thing. Everybody, uh, drop those comments down below. And thank you for checking out today's episode. For all things podcast related, head over to powerproject.live. Follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. <clears throat> my Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And Zima, where are you at? A lot of y'all have been digging the podcast, mm -hmm. right? But if you can and you're listening, go ahead and rate and review us. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, or whatever podcast platform, rate. Because it helps the podcast grow. It helps us reach more people. At Seema Ending on Instagram, YouTube. At Seema Yenya on TikTok and Twitter. Discord's below. Mark. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.